Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. My name is Monica Howitt, and I'm with Seabank, and I want to welcome you all to Making Dollars and Cents of Your Data webinar with Daniel Havey of Solver Incorporated. Daniel is a senior account executive at Solver Global or Solver Incorporated. He has 25 years of experience building, using, and selling business intelligence tools. He has helped clients know their customers' profitability from instrument level and up via funds transfer pricing, activity-based costing, state-of-the-art business intelligence tools. And he is going to share even more reasons why he and Solver are so qualified to be speaking about this topic today. Welcome, Dan. We are so happy to have you. I am now going to pass you the reins, and I will confirm when I can see your slides. All right. Well, thank you, folks. I do appreciate uh, you attending today. Uh, we're, um, again, my name is Dan Havey uh, with Solver, and I'll be walking you through uh, today's presentation, uh, making dollars and cents out of your data. We all have lots of data, uh, but how do we make uh, money out of using our data appropriately? So that's uh, going to be the tone of the presentation. There are going to be four basic uh, parts to this presentation. I want to keep it uh, quick and brisk, so I've, I've uh, got these. So I'm, I'm going to be talking first off, what are the current economic trends for banks and credit unions? What do we see out there? Uh, and then moving on uh, to two, it'll be you know, what are the current pain points? Uh, to make dollars and cents out of your data, you have to have some type of uh, measurement system, BI solution. Uh, we're going to talk about corporate performance management and what are the pain points uh, to get one propped up uh, these days. Uh, next section will be is, okay, once you got a corporate performance management, what are some of the KPIs? What are the metrics? What are some of the things banks are using today uh, to, uh, to go about corporate performance management? And then the last topic will be, well, what are the best of breed doing? You know, what, are they, uh, what do I see out in the marketplace? And then we'll wrap up a real quick video, uh, like two minutes, 53 seconds, uh, as long as a, an old Beatles tune. Uh, so just to go through a real quickly a visual of uh, what I'll be showing you today. And uh, wrap up with questions, polling questions, all those good things. All right, so let's move on to our first uh, section here, uh, current economic trends for banks and credit unions. And uh, what do we see out in the marketplace uh, today is uh, lots of shrinking fees uh, and more and more folks, uh, any type of fee, they're going to, you know, complain, gripe, uh, just get upset. Uh, there's just a reduced uh, profit expectations. Uh, customers are likely to have a relationship with multiple vendors. I've got my mortgage loan with Bank of America. I've got my wealth management with Northwestern Mutual. My checking account was with SunTrust. Uh, so customers are fragmented. They're all over the place. Uh, and it'd be nice to have them all under one roof. Uh, with increased mobile uh, technology, there is less interaction with customers, especially the younger ones. And we'll get more into that. Uh, but folks uh, just don't like to go into a branch anymore. They'd rather uh, just be on their iPhone. Everywhere you go, folks are glued to their iPhones. That's just how they do business. Uh, as well, folks are now comparing every vendor experience to that of Amazon or iTunes. Uh, you just go to a website, you never go to an Amazon store. Uh, they already know who you are, what you've purchased, and uh, and they queue up some recommendations even before you start interacting with the, with uh, the company. That's what people are starting to expect from every vendor, including banks. Uh, lots of personalization. The more that your vendor knows about your customer, the more personal their interaction is. Uh, as well, uh, wealthy customers, the older ones, still demand a mass amount of high touch. Uh, they come into the branch often and want you to explain their statement. Uh, so uh, you, you got to balance a, a high tech approach with the younger generation with the high touch, if you will, for the older generation. Here's what the big banks need to understand about the millennials, you know, the younger crowd. Uh, they're the largest living generation. They've actually surpassed uh, the baby boomers. And uh, research shows in just a couple of years, in about eight years, they're going to generate about half of all U.S. income. And so obviously they're a, uh, uh, a demographic that uh, banks and credit unions need to know who they are uh, and how to cater to them. Uh, the, the rise of all these financial technology firms, these boutique firms, uh, you know, Rocket Mortgage, uh, a lot of these folks that are uh, going after different pieces of your wallet, if you will, the millennials are almost exclusively what the fintech firms are going after. 
so you've got a lot of competition coming up. Uh, and what's interesting, even though I have a lot of my mortgage with one company, my checking account with another company, still three fourths of the millennials would love to have it all under one roof. So there's still a desire for them to have all their banking, uh, credit union relationships with one vendor, if you can just figure out the uh, the customer experience piece. Um, talking to a lot of credit unions, they're uh, stressed out that uh, after five years, a millennial's gone. Well, that's just the research, just, just, that's just the average. One fifth of them will switch their bank or credit union every single year. And so our job is to figure out how do we keep them uh, with me, uh, with, re with your company. In a few more years, uh, there's gonna be 8 billion people on this planet, a lot of old folks. <laughs> And uh, we need to know each and every one of our customers. And uh, so the only way to do that is with good data analytics, good research, uh, background information on who we're dealing with. Uh, it's just going to be a lot more people. And uh, hopefully each branch that's now got 2,000 customers will have 3,000 customers uh, soon enough. So there's a lot of folks just can't do it all by memory. So you have to have good data analytics. A couple of technology trends that are affecting the banking credit union industry in general. Um, everything's going faster. People obviously want quicker payments. Uh, the neat one is uh, the mobile deposit app. Uh, you know, there's still some dinosaurs out there that write checks. Uh, my wife's got a landscaping business and she likes to get paid by check. And now she can just take her iPhone, take a picture of the check and boop, it's right into uh, the, the uh, checking account. Uh, putting credit card scanners on mobile devices. Uh, so I can be out in the field covered in dirt and mud. Uh, but if I've got a you know an iPad with me with that uh, little scanner, I can just take your credit card as a payment. I don't have to uh, you know meet you in a brick and mortar building anymore. Uh, another neat thing, uh, there's a, um, a credit union here in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, that my wife has her business account with. She hasn't met a person yet. Each of the locations has a bank of kiosks, and it's a person behind it, but they're in one central place. And uh, so she's talking to a teller, but it's on, on a screen, and that teller is somewhere else. So uh, teller conferencing, that way one teller can cover 12 branches at one time. If, uh, and uh, and the whole point is is to make interactions with your customers cheaper, quicker. Uh, it's just getting so expensive as more and more customers come in and uh, come to the credit union or bank. You just need to figure out cheaper ways to tra uh, deal with them, transact with them. All right. So what are the biggest uh, trends affecting the profitability of the financial sector? Uh, well, as we all know, in the last uh, seven, uh, eight, nine years or so. Uh, rates have been extremely low to encourage borrowing. So uh, so that's uh, been uh, in our favor. Uh, obviously, with the rise on the stock market, investor confidence is, is growing as well. Uh, but with, with one of the problems, and uh, we've got someone who's saying they're going to help us out with that, is uh, regulations. A good friend of mine who runs the data analytics for SunTrust, a bank out of Atlanta, I worked with them about a dozen years ago. We had lots of fun building all sorts of predictive models. Uh, well, he's now the manager of the department, and he says 50% of his day is filling out regulatory reports on why this model is relevant, how it's not discriminating against people. Has it been updated recently? Are these metrics old? So his half of his job now is regulations, and the other half is in meetings, and all the fun of doing data <laughs> analytics is uh, you know, sort of gone by the wayside. So obviously regulations add lots and lots of cost and time uh, eating into our profits. All right, so a couple of more trends, uh, you know, less branch traffic, we, you know, they've been saying this for years and years, oh, brick and mortar are gonna die, I don't see it. There's still a lot of branch traffic, but it is getting less and less. Uh, but, uh, and also the digital experience, so we see, uh, uh, and branches going mobile. I see it at Chick-fil-A a lot. Uh, as you're out there, the long line to order that sandwich, uh, one of the uh, reps will just come out to your car with an iPad and take your order, and it's obviously interfacing you know, with, the, with the back office. and so. so we're seeing a lot of that as the tellers roaming the branch floor or the uh, customer service rep uh, with an iPad. So they're bringing the digital experience as well as using it as an education. Hey, did you know you don't need to come into the branch? Here's our online app and here's how you can deposit a check, uh, things like that. 
Uh, some folks, I just don't see it, but some of these folks are saying that also banks might start charging for convenience. Hey, we're at the intersection of 10th and Main Street, uh, come in to do a transaction, but if you come in person, we might have to uh, charge you a dollar for each charge. Uh, Interesting article, but uh, I, don't, I really don't see that happening. And then obviously mobility, uh, of, of payments and deposits, uh, using your iPhone to transact business and with the bank. Current pain points for corporate performance management. Uh, again, our goal is you've got a lot of data. How do we turn that into money for you? Uh, and uh, well, there's some technology involved uh, to get us there. And uh, some of the pain points with technology today is um, in my core provider, deals with my loans and deposits. And then it may have my wealth management system on another technology. So let's say my core uh, provider is on an uh, AS400 uh, or an, uh, an I-series, I guess is what IBM calls it today. But my wealth management might be web-based. And then my general ledger that takes all the transactions might be with SAP. And uh, so there are all different platforms where all these data silos are, if you will. Uh, they're not really well integrated, um, and newer technologies are coming online so fast these days that disrupt. So I've got a whole network built for taking mortgage applications, and then Rocket Mortgage comes out, and I tried it. I refinanced my home, and it was so painless. Uh, all I had to do was upload a few documents and track everything with my iPhone, the progress, even the DocuSign and Adobe came up on my iPhone, and I could sign documents with my iPhone. So these new technologies are coming up. They're really upsetting the apple cart, if you will, for our old legacy systems. Uh, people challenges. Uh, before I uh, came to Solver, I worked with a firm that, uh, believe it or not, still had some mainframe clients. And uh, we had one programmer. His name was Jack. He was 68. Uh, and he would come in Wednesdays and Fridays for a couple of hours to maintain the, the mainframe. It wasn't written in COBOL 68. Those people, there are fewer and fewer folks that have expertise on these old legacy systems, keeping them up to date. IT departments, uh, these, there's 10 pain points, but you know the biggest one is just isolating the problem. Uh, it's taken them, you know, according to this research here, 40% of their time just to figure out what is the problem, as opposed to here it is and resolving it right away. As we all know in, in news today, we have to deal with disaster recovery. If my server goes down, how quickly can I get it back up? Cybersecurity, malware, ransomware, all sorts of threats uh, going against our data, as well as audits. Uh, do you have proper controls in place? Are they well documented? Uh, it's getting to be a bigger and bigger deal. One of the problems with IT being able to keep up with all these new disruptive technologies is three-fourths of their budget is just simply spent on maintenance, you know, installing upgrades, uh, keeping up with the, the latest releases, uh, doing their own disaster recovery. Uh, so there's a, so much money sunk into what you got, it's very, very hard to start new projects and get things going. Um, and if a server goes down, it's extremely expensive. Uh, with a bank in Atlanta, a few years ago, they were testing out some stuff, and for whatever reason, someone ran 20 jobs. It was against their live data and brought the system down. Their, their ATMs, their teller lines for about 30 minutes. It's like, ah, it's very expensive. Uh, so uh, those are some issues. And then the other thing is compliance. As you know, as new rules, regulations come up, uh, you don't have time to rewrite the software. You have to put a patch in place. Not the best way to deal with compliance. Uh, all right, so let's get on to uh, corporate performance management itself. Uh, in the past, uh, it used to be uh, I would send the general ledger out, you know, a trial balance, and I'd be looking at loans and deposits, net interest income, service charges. And uh, do it at the corporate level or the uh, the, the institution level, mutual level, uh, whatever uh, form you are. And that was it. You know, how am I doing according to my general ledger? And it was usually backwards dependent. Well, we had net income of twenty dollars per share, two million dollars uh, net profit or gross margin versus 1.8 of last year or versus uh, a budget of 2.1. It was just GL dependent. Now, when it comes to getting much more data into your analysis 
folks are using things outside the general ledger to come up with their financials. Uh, so general ledger planning, forecasting is now using drivers as opposed to just typing in salary, I'm typing in headcount, I'm typing in vacancies, I'm typing in pay increases, much more robust information that's outside the GL to help fill out my planning and forecasting. Same thing if I'm doing a loan forecast, rather than just typing in loan balance by branch by month, by loan type, now I'm putting in uh, numbers of loans originated by officer. I'm putting in the dollar amount they're putting, or originating. Some folks are even putting in attrition rates, you know, or the pay down rates, or the amortization rates. And they won't even type in the loan balances. They'll let the math calculate it. But they're just using much more rich information uh, for GL reporting and planning. Also, they're going much deeper than the institution level. So now, obviously, we want to know how we're doing at the regional level. Uh, the branch level, line of business level, you know, my mortgage profitability, my uh, checking account profitability. Obviously, customer is very important. Uh, and instrument. In order to uh, do a lot of this stuff, you really have to get it down to the instrument level. What is each instrument doing in order that I can add those instruments up by customer, by line of business branch? Uh, so we'll get into a lot of uh, instrument uh, type measurement profitability. Uh, we need to manage our costs better, deepen the customer relationship. Uh, and so with all this information, we're going to use it to figure out. So if we've got some products that are really expensive to service, like checking accounts, that's why online banking come up, came about, is because all this teller traffic and payments and writing checks is expensive. Expensive. But if they can do it via online and take the human element out of some of the process, you're going to uh, reduce the cost for your customer to transact with the bank. Uh, so, uh, so, so a lot of these metrics have to tell you where the problems lie. Uh, same thing with pricing decisions. Uh, my, uh, a lot of folks would do uh, odd term CD campaigns to raise a bunch of money. So you know, let's say it's a, a seven month campaign and you're gonna you know, pay out 50 basis points more than you would on a six month CD, just so you can get a lot of those rate chasers loaded up on that money. Uh, and then hopefully after the seven months expire, it just rolls over quietly into the six month pricing and back to your normal spread. Uh, but uh, if you're not measuring the profitability at the instrument level, and you got a whole bunch of money uh, for that seven month money and it's all underwater, what did you do? You know, you cost the bank a lot of money and uh, and those folks are usually rate, rate um, shoppers anyways. As soon as it rolls over, they're gonna go somewhere else. So you need to have this information to make better pricing decisions. You wanna have good campaigns, but do they make economic sense? Uh, so we're gonna talk about a strategic approach to performance management, uh, i.e. the balance scorecard. I see this uh, at, a, at a lot of uh, banks, did this at SunTrust, uh, as well as a, a few other banks. The, the concept here is it's no longer measuring the performance of the bank strictly by the finance for the GL measures. I need to put in some customer measures. I need to put in some internal process measures, as well as uh, my employees, you know, learning and growth measures. So I'll walk through these four facets so with a few examples. All right, so the, uh, you know, uh, the importance of banking metrics or the finance piece, obviously sales. Uh, that's typically measured in loan production. You know, how many commercial loans, installment loans, second deed of trust, home equity loans am I producing by branch, by officer? Uh, obviously, that's important. Uh, what's your return on assets? These are all the normal, boring uh, financial ratios, debt ratio. What's my loan to deposit ratio, earnings per share, and net price? So those won't go away. Obviously, you need to know how your customers are doing. As we mentioned earlier, those millennials, one fifth of them are attriting or leaving every single year. What am I doing to retain them? Can I slow it down to only one sixth of them leaving it every year? Uh, so obviously you need to be doing customer satisfactions, uh, market share, uh, you, you, you open up a new branch and you're on target uh, when you did your demographic study to take 5% market share. Well, how are you tracking? You know, are you tracking it? Uh, what's your profit per customer? Uh, on average, maybe it should be $100. What are you doing to get it to $102? Um, customer retention, we already talked about. 
Um, profit per customer is there twice. Good one. Sorry about that. And then obviously uh, increasing your wallet share. Uh, if you're measuring cross-sell ratio, I see typicals, it's one point something, 1.5, 1.7. Are you tracking it? What are your goals to get it over two? Uh, extremely important. Internal processes, uh, number of new services. Um, you know, a lot of times, uh, even on the teller line, how many teller transactions per teller per hour or per day? Uh, you want to have a metric. Are the tellers spending too much time? Um, you know, is, is, is 100 transactions an hour good? Uh, so you need to measure that. What are the number of uh, loans per loan officer? How many accounts can they possibly uh, manage properly? You need to track that. And then lastly is um, how are your employees doing? You know, what's the uh, employee satisfaction? Are you uh, holding them accountable to training? Do you pay for training? Uh, are you tracking the number of hours that your employees uh, are, are, are uh, taking for training each year? Are there certifications? Are they going to banker school? Uh, you you want to track that because, again, you want to have improved performance on all four quadrants, quadrants, if you will. Here's an example of what we call the balance scorecard. Here's one I, I implemented uh, a few years back. Uh, the goal here is you don't want to bury – so this is for branches. You could have one for a product line. You could have one for a department. You know, the sky's the limit. And uh, here, this bank, uh, what they did – is their branch managers were measured on about a dozen, uh, um, uh, in, this, in this case here, 10 specific goals. And uh, the year would go along, and then once the year end was over, then accounting would spend the next month or two running all sorts of reports and diagnostics, sending them out to the branch managers, how do they compare to their goals, and by March, they would have their scores ready and then sit down with the regional exec, and get their ratings and then decide, you know, hey, you got a 1% raise, you got nothing, you're awful, you, you know. But it, it was such a pain in the neck. So we came up with a balanced scorecard that would allow them to see how they're doing every single month. And if they're deficient in a measure, they could take corrective behavior, attempt to fix it or improve it before the year is over and, you know, the time was out. And, it, and so in this case here, we're looking at uh, monthly loan growth is one goal, and I'll just sort of walk through this line. So there's a trend here, and obviously I've hidden column C through N, uh, just because I wanted to have some screen space here. Uh, but every single month, hopefully your loans are growing. Sometimes your pay downs will be quicker than uh, your production. Uh, but you've got an average monthly goal, and then on here in column P, their year-to-date average, uh, excuse me, the year-to-date uh, monthly growth, if you added them all up, was $2 million. All right, over to the right is how do they stack up to their peers or the goals? And uh, if they had below $2 million, they'd be in the first quartile or in tier one. And if they scored below $2 million, they got a score of one on that measure. If they're between two and $4 million, they got a two on that measure. Between four and six, they got a three. And obviously, if it was greater than $6 million, they would get a four for that measure. Well, they're at monthly growth when you added it all up was 2.1 million so they got a score of two on that one measure loan production they did 10.8 million so they blew it out of the water as far as loan production uh, just didn't get the growth they were looking for so they got a four on that measure uh, but you can see they're they're using various measures that align with the branch managers goals to determine uh, the branch managers performance at the end of the day, they got a raw score of 20 and an average score of 2.5. If four is perfection and one is you're fired, you know, they're, they're in the middle of the pack. Uh, but they were able to get this report on a monthly basis, see where they needed help, and they would focus on those things to see if they could up their scores. Very, very motivational and uh, help folks improve a lot of performance. And that's the end of the day of CPM is to improve performance. Uh, a lot of struggles with uh, customer profitability. I'm gonna talk to the graph here on the left to sort of make my point. And this is almost across all industries, definitely for banks. And so this green line represents cumulative profitability. And let's just say I've got a thousand branches at my customer. The average is 2,200, but for giggles, let's just say a thousand. And you'll notice, uh, and it's ranked by the most profitable customers on the far left. And so 
the intersect and the you know this branch made eighty one thousand eight hundred and ten dollars for the year for the month however you want to do it and you'll notice it intersects at around 10 12 percent so my most profitable 10 12 percent of the customers equals my complete branch profitability then the next 20 or so percent 30 percent only provides incremental profitability and then it trails off the last 50% are actually costing the bank, the credit union money. So you know, the question is, do you throw them out? No, you try to figure out how to make them profitable. But the point is you need to know who is the most profitable. <laughs> you need to know who's costing you money because your behavior and how you treat them, your, your marketing programs are gonna be extremely important uh, on how you deal with these folks. I mean, the folks that are losing you money, do you set up appointments and you know spend a lot of time servicing those accounts? No, you might send them an email campaign. Hey, here's something on home equity loans you might be interested in, but you wanna transact with them as cheap as possible. If they're in the branch a lot, hey, you might educate them on online banking in cheaper ways to transact with the bank. So let's start off, first of all, with funds transfer pricing. I've seen a couple of folks say, hey, we used to do it, it was real hard, don't know why we would keep doing it, didn't see the value. So the traditional approach to a bank, a credit union, when they list, a, let's say, a yield rate uh, analysis of their various loans and deposits. And my commercial loans are yielding 4.5%. My checking accounts, I'm paying out 10 basis points. Uh, they're just simply scores. And here's how I'm just sort of making fun of it. You know, these are scores. Uh, you know, my bank is called Chicago, and I've got my various instruments. My bears are averaging uh, all the way to the right. Uh, well, just the, all the way to the left. The Bears are averaging 32 points, the White Sox are four point, and your know, Cubbies are 5.1, the Bulls are 91. And my average yield is 134. That doesn't mean anything. How are the Bears doing against their competition? How's the White Sox doing against the competition? I need to know how the Bears are doing against relevant football teams that could care less what they're doing against the Sox and the Cubs and the Bulls. It doesn't mean anything. Those transfer pricing is gonna compare your loans, your deposits, to like uh, investments that are very safe and you're gonna compare them to the investment. So for instance, a deposit comes into the bank and in theory, I'm gonna invest those deposit dollars in a very safe investment. All right, what's the yield on those investments? And likewise, if I decide to lend that money out, then what investment am I trading in to extend my yield to get a better yield on loans? Uh, so that's what funds transfer pricing is all about. Three uh, real high level approaches. I've seen some folks say, yeah, I can't track it by loan and deposit. That's real hard. That's fine. Then you should use Fed funds plus 150 basis points for both loans and deposit. A deposit comes into the bank. How does it compare to Fed funds plus 150 basis points? And then when I lend that money out, how does it compare to Fed funds plus 150 basis points? Works for a lot of smaller institutions. Let's say they're below a couple hundred million. That's good enough. It's easy to implement, but you want to compare your loans and deposits to something that's safe. I've seen other folks and say, well, we've actually got investment pools. We've got two-year money. We've got three-year money. We've got some securities that are out five years. And I'm going to actually compare my loans and deposits with like maturities to the pools I have on hand. That's okay, but it's not a perfect world. It's just how good your investment manager is in investing in those pools. Uh, what I've seen, what I've seen a lot of folks do it that sort of go is to mash maturities against U.S. Treasuries. What they'll do is they'll look up the U.S. Treasury rate for that month for that security. So, for instance, I got a 30-day CD uh, that's paying out one and a quarter. Let's say. Well, the Fed funds rate is two and a half. Obviously, these rates are a little old, uh, but how do I compare to U.S. Treasuries? And they enter it in a rate table, and then just compare those CDs for one month to the rate there. If I did a three-year car loan, I'm going to compare it to the average rate of 3.43 on my graph here. All right, so we talk about funds transfer pricing. You also need to figure out what does it cost to service the customer? You know, what does it cost to originate a loan, cost to originate a deposit, how much maintenance costs? Uh, you know, obviously loans may cost a lot more to service uh, or maybe a high activity checking account than one that's just a CD that's on the books that's just, you know, uh, you know adding uh, interest uh, each month. But what you want to do is you want to come up with those various activities 
that are affecting uh, the servicing of those individual instruments. Obviously, origination, servicing, teller items, bill pay, payments, wires, all those good things. You don't have to be exhausted. Just come up with a, a, a handful of items that can be tracked via TRAN codes in your tra uh, uh, your loan activity uh, tables or your, your deposit activity tables and come up with those counters and apply the cost to come up with a, a total activity cost for each instrument. Uh, you need to be able to do that. Some folks do exhaustive time, you know, studies on how long does it take a teller to take a payment for a commercial account versus a deposit for a consumer account. You do that. Uh, but there's a lot of just standard costs out there. There are some consulting firms that help folks do that. We've got some basic costs we can apply. And all you want to do is just get it close. You want to be able to, you've got all these counters, you want to associate costs so I can come up with my servicing costs. So you've taken care of the, the net interest margin with funds transfer pricing, the servicing costs. Obviously, you should be able to track all the uh, fees, service charges that's associated with. And then when you add it up, uh, here's an example of net profit by customer, just simply adding it up by customer account or household ID uh, to come up with, you know, how is this customer, Bob Thompson, doing uh, for January? And uh, so he's got four instruments with us, a commercial loan, a home equity loan, an installment loan, borrowing a lot of money from us. But good thing he's got a lot of money with us in CDs as well. And so he's got his balances, his rate, his transfer rate, the term, origination date, essentially the margin on those balances, uh, the NIM for the month, $115. Then I've got my monthly costs. You know, some of them have teller items, uh, some of them have online costs. And then the way this uh, this uh, company uh, bank uh, approached uh, the origination cost is more the FAS 91 approach. They want to defer it over the term of the loan, the term of the, de of the deposit. If you take those origination costs up front, uh, the customer loses a bunch of money the day one, and then they're trying to dig themselves out of a hole the rest of the relationship. FAS 91 allows you to defer those costs over the life of the loan or deposit. Just smooth things out a little bit. So uh, here, this uh, Bob Thompson, you know, he's made uh, $47 uh, for the month. Hopefully $50 times 12 months, $600 relationship. Pretty good relationship. Here's an example of product profitability. Looking at loans, you know, it could be deposits. It starts from the instrument level, and then you're adding them all up for uh, for commercial loan. Uh, moving along, uh, what are some of the results, applications? Uh, you're improving operational efficiencies. If uh, you know certain types of accounts are very expensive to service, why? Let's figure out cheaper ways to help the customer, uh, but make it more efficient. Uh, improve marketing is not if I know who's making the money I know what you know send them the love send them uh, you know much more attention uh, and then with the people that cost me a lot of money figure out ways to either increase cross sell what are some of the best and best in class banks and credit unions doing with CPM corporate performance management well uh, to when they kick off the uh, the project you know how does the CPM scale you know, is it only GL only, or is this thing really scale up quickly? Uh, is it easy to maintain? I don't want to spend million dollars putting a CPM thing and then have to main, spend another 100000 a month to maintain it. Uh, how easy is it to bring in other products? Let's say I started out doing loan and deposit profitability, but I want to bring in safe deposit box, wealth management, other things. How easy it is to bring in those new processes and products. A lot of benefits of cloud. Uh, it's cheaper. Newer technology is coming out on cloud. I know we've got a lot of security concerns with cloud, uh, but that's one way to quickly adopt uh, CPM. Focusing on key drivers for all lines of business now, not just branches anymore. They're focusing on the item processing department. They're focusing on the HR department. What are the drivers that are relevant for all parts of the business? I want to be able to track them and uh, see how they're improving over time. Uh, let's see here, uh, improving data quality, obviously implementing funds transfer pricing and, and activity-based costing. Uh, so this is what I see uh, well-managed companies doing is they're just tracking a lot more uh, items. So in order to do this enterprise-wide reporting, a lot of folks are implementing a data warehouse. I've got data from my core provider, my wealth management system, my general ledger, just use a data warehouse to pull it all together. I'll make it easy. It's all in one place. Um, they're also implementing self-service analytics. The tools 
that are out there are getting better and better and better. I you know, worked with Cognos for a few years, real difficult uh, to work with. I've worked with Oracle OBIE. That's it. But there's so many more tools out there now that are so much easier to use, Excel-based. Um, the goal, obviously, is to understand your customer completely, not just from a loan perspective. But uh, every way they interact with the bank, I want to get a comprehensive view. Um, there's increased collaboration. As I'm doing these drivers for all my departments, uh, usually accounting is sort of the scorekeeper. They have to come up with dashboards to keep up with all this stuff. Uh, but if they're doing it with the old Excel spreadsheets, they email out a template, uh, the HR department fills in their template and they send it to accounting and back and forth, uh, it takes forever. So that's why cloud is becoming so popular is you just put this stuff on a cloud and uh, you know there's no more emailing a spreadsheet. You dial in, fill in your numbers, hit enter, loads it right into a database and accounting has immediate access. Um, a lot of tools out there that offer on-premise. The bank owns it. It's behind their firewall, and they prop it up on their own web server. Private cloud is exactly the same thing. It's a, it's just a URL, but it's inside the bank firewall. So let's say you want to host some of these newfangled tools out there on the cloud, but you're not ready to go outside the firewall. That's fine. Azure, Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services will prop up a, a, a machine for you back it up to your bank data center, park it inside the firewall, and now it's a private cloud. Or if you're ready to go public cloud. A lot of certifications are needed had to go full public cloud, but uh, that, that's the trend. And obviously you wanna have lots of dashboards. Uh, KPIs uh, is, you know, these, these uh, as you travel in an airport, everybody's looking at their iPhone. Why not have corporate performance management on your iPhone? To do that, it has to be on a web of some sort, whether it's web-based on the premise, private cloud. So you can see all these dashboards. No one's gonna read a spreadsheet on their iPhone, but I can, I can look at this dashboard and I can see, okay, something's going up, something's going down, double click it and I'll drill into. Enterprise budgeting, the same thing. I'm, I'm measuring everything. I need a way to capture all this data. So same concept, I've got these, uh, templates, tracking, headcount. Here's an example of uh, loan forecasting. Where in yellow, I'm typing in loan production, numbers of loans, and the dollars produced, and it's generating on that last row the average balance versus the original plan that's on the first row. Uh, so I'm using drivers as opposed to just typing in, you know, the, the loan number. Once you segment in your customers, who's most profitable, who's least profitable, who's costing you money, you're going to come up with marketing strategy. Uh, in quadrant A, these are my large balances, uh, high profitability, but high activity. Typically, you're going to focus on customer service, whereas the millennials, they're profitable, but they're not really transacting a lot with the bank. You know, they just do it on the web. Uh, they're all about the customer experience. You have a lousy app they're probably gonna go somewhere else. So FinTech, as I said before, they're chasing this specific group. Uh, we need to come up with a strategy. Segmentation helps you do that. Predictive analytics, you got tons and tons of data. Uh, there's a lot of vendors out there that can take all your transactional data to, to, to detect fraud. Uh, uh, Bankers Toolbox is a great company that has, does stuff like that. Uh, coming up with scores, you know, I look at all the customer activity and are they likely to buy something? Are they likely to leave the bank? Uh, do I use this information to open up a new brand, a new branch, uh, as well as staffing branches, risk uh, of charge off? So there's a lot of stuff predictive analytics is doing today. You need to have a place to store all those scores, and a lot of those folks will run all these predictive analytics and store those scores back in the data warehouse. With so what Dan is going to show here, we've asked him to show a – uh, just an example of all the things he's talking through with Solver's product. And so he's going to show that real fast. Real sure quickly, uh, the BI360, uh, this is what we do to help folks. So we have a data warehouse that collects data from all sorts of places. Uh, so you want to you know, pull it in from you know, your ERP, your, your core provider, your Excel spreadsheets, your data warehouse, bring in a data warehouse, and then it allows Excel to be a report writer building budgeting templates and dashboards and it allows a, a web portal to present all that stuff. So here's an example of looking at the, the data warehouse manager. You can look at all your tables uh, on the left. It's very easy to import information. Uh, you can interrogate the data. Uh, you can just enter a parameter or two and see what are the rows of the tables. Uh, you can import data from Excel spreadsheets. 
or obviously directly from your ERP, you know, writing extracts, loan extracts, safe deposits and such. Once you got your data warehouse up and running, the Excel add-in allows you to just simply look at your data warehouse on the left, drag fields into a report. It's real easy, intuitive to build a report and just drag into, into the report. And then when you got a report that you like, you'll hit a run button. And if you got a parameter, you'll pick a month or a year. And this is looking at funds transfer rates uh, by month, hit it. And then the yellow allows you to update those rates for the next month. Once you've got a report that you like, then you can just click upload this document, this report or this uh, budget template to my web portal. Flip it over to the web portal. It's gonna have a look and feel like iTunes playlists, if you will. Here's my forecast report I like to play with. Uh, departmental forecast. Uh, if I'm a budget, uh, you know, person, you know, I'm looking at my personnel, or I'm entering headcount and pay rates and all those types of things. Uh, make those changes and it uploads it the report. Or if it's just the end of the month, I'm just simply reviewing reports, dashboards. You know, if I'm a mobile device, I'm probably going to look at the dashboards, pretty graphs and such. Pull it up. Look at my report. If I want to change maybe uh, the year, I'm looking at 2015. This is sort of a, a year view. Uh, but if I want to just pick a different year, click refresh. And you know, the, the web portal with those Excel templates is just simply reconnecting the data warehouse and refreshing on the fly. Uh, so now I've got a question with, say, expenses. Then I want to flip over to my expense report that I built in Excel and published up to the web portal. And then I just scroll down looking at my expenses. If something looks amiss, every field, every number, you can drill into it, whether it's loan balance, a, a loan trial, general ledger information, the CRM. It just depends on what that report was built off from the data warehouse. All the fields are drillable. And then you just navigate from a, you know, a loan item to the expense report itself. So that was real quick. I know I went through it fast, but just want to give you an overview. It's ease of use of using Excel to build all those templates, load it up to a web portal, and it's very easy to navigate. If you have any questions, any comments, any additional dialogue to add to the discussion, by all means, don't be shy. Email Dan as of right now. Dan, anything else you want to say or I can close us out? I thank you all for your attention and uh, looking forward to hearing the feedback. Thank you so much, Dan. Well, on behalf of Dan Salver and Alice Seabank, I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon, or this morning, or afternoon, depending on your time zone. Um, many thanks to you, Dan, of course, for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. Thanks to your company for lending you to us for an hour or two. As of right now, this concludes the webinar. We hope that everybody has a great Tuesday and rest of your week, and we will see you all back here again soon. Thank you again, Dan. My pleasure. All right. Bye-bye.